Hello, everyone, and welcome back, finally, at long last, to Binge Battle. It's a show that we kicked off during that little pandemic last year. We had such a blast doing it. We said, how are we going to get this back? Who are we going to bring back for the first episode? What's the topic going to be? And now we are finally ready to go. I'm your host, Mark Ellis, and this show is going to take you through multiple rounds of spirited competitive-ish debate about a singular topic. In this case, it's going to be one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. And we have two great guests here that have very strong opinions about said show. We always love for our friends watching from home to get in on the action. You can tweet me at any time at Mark Ellis Live or hit us up at Rotten Tomatoes. However you're enjoying the show, we appreciate you being on board. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a spicy one. And we're all going to be tapping our inner Unagi, because that's right. Friends is our topic, and I have two of my dear friends that are going to be guesting and competing on this. I'm going to call it a debut episode of Binge Battle. We're rebooting it, and we're back, and here is your very first competitor. She is not only a dear friend of mine, you also know her as the co-creator and one of the stars of the Hit Endeavor World Girls. You can catch her on her daily show live at the Roxy, and pretty soon you can see her in theaters with her new film, always Lola. She is always a delight. And her name is Roxy Stryer. Welcome back to Binge Battle Rocks. Ooh, Nagi. I'm bringing a heat today. I have been preparing my entire life for this moment, or at least since 1994. Come on, Mark. This is like, I was born for this. I was born. I'm ready. I'm nervous. I'm willing. I'm able. Have you ever gone so far in your friend's fandom as to wear the wedding dress that we see Rachel Green wearing in the very opening episode, the series debut? I would say my prom dress was pretty close, Mark. Pretty close. Thanks to David Bridal. I mean, I really, I try, I do my best and I ate that ice cream on the couch just the same. What was your first experience? Because I know you're a little younger than I. What was your first experience with Friends? Were you catching it live or was it something you caught later on with a streaming service? When was Roxy Stryer introduced to six of her now best friends? Yeah, my parents didn't care what age I was. They were having me watch TV right out of the womb. So I watched this with my mom growing up every single week. Uh, and this I, I was watching in real time. And then I finally got to the age that I could actually remember things. And of course, had to get the Friends VHS set uh, because we had all of the VHSs on tape in my in the cabinet. And then the DVD set came out, got that as well. Uh, Blu-ray came out, got that as well. And now, you know, you can get it anywhere. So I've I've been watching from day one and then re-watching from day two, three, four, and so on. All right. So if Roxy wins today's celebration party at her place, bring your own VCR. We might need to borrow one. So Roxy, we're going to meet your competitor right now, who also happens to be a dear friend of mine. He is the co-host of the hit show, Blurds in the Hood. You can also catch him hosting the Citizen on Air app. He's a talented actor, comedian, and host. And now he's here to talk about his love of friends. The one, the only, Mr. Winston Marshall is back. Winston, I see that you're repping a different fandom today, but you are prepared and you were made aware that this is a Friends show, not a Spider Person show. You, you, you do know that this was actually Ross's favorite superhero. I don't know if you knew that. So like, you know, I'm already in the mode. I'm in the mode, man. I'm ready to go. Uh, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Obviously, great, great friends with you and with Rox. So this is always fun when the three of us get to hang out. But I'm here to win. And you'll you'll find out like very early on that even, even my answers are tied to how badly I'm about to win this. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, friends has been a part of my lexicon for so long. It's one of those things where it's like, it doesn't make sense how much I've watched some of these episodes. And I, I unfortunately did not have the entire season uh, on DVD or anything like that. I just had season four. So there's a lot of influence from season four of just watching the same things over and over and over again. <laughs> but eventually I did end up getting five and six and some more. But So I just had like the middle seasons that I watched religiously and then eventually, once you were able to watch it all over the place, or if it was in syndication, obviously you'd catch other episodes. But I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm so excited, man. 
I would say that's arguably the peak of friends is when you get into that season four or five before Joey and Rachel almost had a thing. I, I think yeah. right there in the middle is the meat of that sandwich. But what was the first friends experience that you had, Winston? Was it watching it live on air or was it after the fact? I actually want to say it was from a friend of mine. It was in high school. Uh, so the show was getting closer to the end of, of its run. Um, but, uh, or like middle school, high school, whatever. And he was like, oh, you watch Friends? And I was like, no. And he's like, what do you mean you don't watch Friends? And he goes, sit down. And so I sat down and I watched it. And I was like, this is hysterical. Like, this is absolutely ridiculous. And to this day, like a lot of people in the world, uh, you know, you quote this all over the place. At, for any point in time, I feel like I've used a number of these different uh, quotables throughout my life. So I'm super ready for it, man. I, I love People this quote show. this show when they don't even realize they're quoting it. Like when I say, could I be more excited to be back doing binge <laughs> battle with two of these fine folks? And so as we get everybody here on the playing surface, it's so funny that Roxy brings up the VCR aspect of this because Friends debuted in 1994 mm -hmm. and my family instantly fell in love with it. We got a gentle nudge from my aunt who was staying with us at the time she said we got to watch this new show everybody fell in love and we taped it one night because we were at dinner we get back and i hit play on it i guess i was the tech person in the family and i fast forwarded through the opening credits and my dad got so upset because he's like the song's the best part everybody <laughs> in the family was hooked on the rembrandts was hooked on i'll be there for you and of course the show that ensued and so Here's how the show is going to work today. We technically have four rounds, but don't worry. If it ends in a two-to-two -two tie, we have a tiebreaker round just in case. I will be judging each round. Each round is going to be composed of three phases. You'll each get a minute to have your opening argument, and then you'll each get a 30-second rebuttal period. Then you each also have a final statement that you can close the round with. It's going to be a loose minute and a loose 30 and a loose final statement, but I ask that you don't go over a minute. If you do, don't worry. I'm sure I have some sort of sound effects that me and our great engineer Christian can come up with. So <laughs> that's going to be the way that it goes. The winner will be declared. And then I want to make sure that we part as friends just as we entered. And so I want to make sure that we get all of your latest and greatest streaming recommendations where all the fine folks can find you after the show, because you're going to win over a lot of fans today. I might lose some friends, but y'all are going to be introduced to a whole <laughs> new world of possibilities, followers and pals. And so with that, I say we start with a practice question, just to get everybody warmed up, just to get us revved right. to go, get that 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 Phoebe running stride down. Here it is, your opening <laughs> question. And again, this is worth no points. I just want to get a minute from each of you, starting with you, Winston. Did you see the Friends reunion? And if so, how do you like it? I did see the Friends reunion. Um, I think it completely... It swept me off my feet in the sense that, like, A, a lot of them, a lot of the friends outside of Aniston, you don't see quite as much. So to see where they're all at now is so interesting. Obviously, I know uh, Matt LeBlanc's on, uh, he was on episodes for a while, and, you know, uh, Lisa Kudrow's been all over the place. But, like, the thing that really got me, other than, you know, Jan is showing up and whatever, was hearing that Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer actually had feelings for each other they could never act on. And I was like, oh my God, are Ross and Rachel going to actually happen? And like the fact that that started to pop up in the news that they were hanging out together, I I, I swear I completely was just like, ah, ah, for like a good like couple of weeks after that. So it was wonderful, man. I definitely recommend people watch it. Uh, Roxy, was that, was that your big takeaway when you saw the Friends reunion? Absolutely. I mean, if you are a diehard Friends fan like Winston and I are, then you can't watch that and hear Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer talk about having feelings for each other and not just like have your mind be blown. But one of the main takeaways for me was the fact that this is just so ingrained in pop culture that we have a fashion show that Justin Bieber is performing in, that Cara Delevingne <laughs> is performing in, like the that the biggest pop star on the planet is coming to sing Smelly Cat with Lisa Kudrow. Like that is insane. There's no other show where the, the biggest celebrities out there right now are taking back seats to the six friends because this is, I don't think that there's any debate at this point. This is the biggest sitcom of all time. And just seeing everybody rally around this reunion, it, it made it feel like, and all those interviews of people across the world, I'm one of them. Like this changed my whole life. And so it just felt huge to me. 
it's a must watch and honestly kind of rude of you, Mark, for asking Winston and I if we saw it like we're some kind of degenerates or something. <laughs> See, look, now I'm already excited, A, because y'all got your 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 juices flowing a little bit, but also we already have an idea for another binge battle episode where we bring Roxy and Winston back to team up to argue what is the greatest sitcom of all time, because that is certainly That's a little spicy, a but idea. it's hard to Oof. argue against it. We'll table that discussion and instead. We will now officially kick off binge battle with round one. Here we go. And your topic is who is the best couple in the history of the show Friends? For that answer, we first go to Roxy Stryer. Minute on the clock at your ready. So obviously there are some main couples uh, that take place on the show. The three main couples being Phoebe and Mike, Monica and Chandler, and Ross and Rachel. And so this really dictates what kind of person you are, what kind of relationship you want to be in, what kind of uh, hope you have for your life based on who you choose as the best couple, which is why, of course, I chose Monica and Chandler. Monica and Chandler are the quintessential couple of the show because they're friends first. We fall in love with their friendship. They are able to not only get through really challenging times, like having to learn how to uh, get rid of jellyfish stings and uh, navigate being somebody's brother while dating their best friend and keeping it a secret and all of those things, but they actually have such a beautiful love story because that's kind of what we all want at the end of the day. You want to fall in love with your best friend. You want to know that person inside and out. You want to believe in that person. And even though we found out there were other people out there for Monica, like Richard, um, and other people out there for Chandler, like Janice, <laughs> uh, we find really at the end of the day, it's about these best friends coming together. They have the most beautiful proposal of all time, too, with Monica getting down on that one knee and Chandler finally being able to commit to somebody because it's the right person. So uh, they have the the most incredible love story that not only do you root for, but you aspire to have for yourself. Okay. I, I like where you're going with this too, because you're kind of putting the onus on everyone to say, hey, who you choose as your favorite couple on Friends is a reflection on you as a person and your own commitment issues. So when I say my favorite couple of all time is when Van Damme flirted with Courtney Cox for one episode after the Super Bowl kind of shows you where I am and who I am in life. Winston Marshall, you now have a minute on the clock for your best couple. Go. All right. So Monica Chandler is a great choice. I'm not going to deny that at all. But I wanted to go for a couple that is a little bit more realistic to how most of us ultimately find love. Of course, the dream is to, you know, the, your best friend from high school it ends up actually being one of your sweethearts and the person you find as your soulmate. But Phoebe and Mike, who I chose for the best couple, it starts off in a pseudo meet cute because Joey is being a kind of a punk and he was supposed to set Phoebe up on a date. And he goes, hey, uh, this guy right here, this is, this is the guy. And it turns out that he actually ends up being the perfect person for Phoebe and their relationship evolves the way, again, most people's relationships tend to evolve. You start off on a couple dates. I kind of like this person. It's not so bad. We get along. You start to fall in love. You're, you're, you're trading keys and all that kind of stuff. And then something major happens that causes you to really evaluate your relationship. And that's that Mike doesn't ever want to get married again. He's already done it before. But he changes and become and makes that compromise to be with the one he loves because he knows that whatever you want, I want to give it to you and Phoebe vice versa. So this is so realistic to how most of us actually find our soulmate. I think that's why I have a tendency to resonate more with Phoebe and Mike, knowing that it's a little bit more natural than the kind of once in a blue moon situation of the person I've known since I was 10 is actually my, my soulmate. Uh, two great uh, couples. And I think there's probably a lot of people saying, are we just tired of Ross and Rachel? Do we just go through so much emotional torment while it was being teased? Will it, won't it, that we're over that just as it happened? That is going to be on the back burner because on the front burner, we got two great arguments. So, Roxy, going back to you, why are Chandler and Monica a better couple than Phoebe and Mike? The thing about Phoebe and Mike, and you're not going to hear me say a bad word about anything about friends. So, you know, don't don't hold your breath for that. But the, the problem with Phoebe and Mike is that I don't know that they're still together today. They don't stand the test of time on this show. And we've even heard the creators of the show talk about the fact that one of the reasons they didn't want to do a reunion 
episode was that they know based on the divorce rates in America, not all these three couples would be together still. And guess what? I think the one they're talking about is Phoebe and Mike. We already went back and forth with Ross and Rachel enough. Monica and Chandler Really, we've seen that they not only can grow together and build together, but they have children together. They move out of the city together. I mean, they're ready for this life. Mike and Phoebe kind of all of a sudden decide, Mike's like, yeah, okay, maybe I could get married again. Phoebe's like, wait, I actually want a white picket fence. How long is that going to last for? We really just don't know. It's a great question, Winston. How do you respond to that? 30 seconds. Well, if we're going to talk about divorce, it most definitely is going to be either Monica and Chandler or Ross and Rachel. Ross and Rachel, just because as much as they love each other, that's one of those really passionate kind of fizzle out. Monica and Chandler, the thing is, they do go through a lot of their random ups and downs. But part of that has to do with the fact that Chandler, as much as I love him and I love him dearly, can be kind of a lot. And so can Monica. And so I can totally see you want to talk about a potential divorce rate. I didn't stop my parents from getting divorced, all right? They had kids and, you know, they split. Monica and Chandler very easily could do the exact same thing based off of a lot of the headbutting they have. Phoebe and Mike, it's one of those situations, they're both so goofy. They're both so kind of in each other's zone like that, that they, they're going to have their rough waters, but they're always going to work it out. This is uh, this is already why I have the toughest job on this show is because I got to make a call here. Final statement about why your couple is the best in the history of friends. Roxy Stryer. Phoebe keeps keeps pet rats and Mike hates things like that. Whatever Monica does, even having a closet of all of her messy things, Chandler embraces because at the end of the day, he knows he cannot live without her and is not going to let her go. Winston. Mike's rich. You think Phoebe gonna give that up? She was homeless. She ain't never leaving that life ever again. She good. She is very happy to be with the <laughs> man that loves her most. This is the argument of practical application versus just that <laughs> feeling in your soul that you can't get rid of. I had a girlfriend in college who had a pet tarantula. Ooh. We obviously did not last together. I was not the most enthused about it, especially the two times it escaped its cage, but we're still friends to this day. And so... Really what this boils down to is what do you want out of your partner? Do you want unpredictability? Do you want oh, this could end tomorrow? We, we're not sure if we get along. I'm not really sure what I want out of life yet. Or are you more like Chandler and Monica where we've been looking for our partner? We've been through many a actor and actress that we've been searching for that right chemistry and we just haven't found it when the whole time it was right across <laughs> the apartment hall. And so oh. I think it's put up a great argument for Phoebe and Mike, but if this show started out as us wanting Ross and Rachel to get together, it ended with us satisfied that we got one couple that we can bank on for the rest of our life. And that is Chandler and Monica. I'm not saying they don't fight. I'm not saying they don't argue all the time, but Chandler and Monica, I feel like that is the strongest fiber. So Roxy Stryer takes the first round in binge battle reboot history in a close one over Winston Marshall, which means it is Winston who gets to kick off round number two. And for that, the question at hand, best guest star in the history of the show. And you both have made great points about this show, really in all of our conversations since we've been buds and talking about this program. And I think that for this segment, guest star can be somebody who popped in and out. It could be Jean-Claude Van Damme after the Super Bowl. You probably already get the point. But it also could be somebody who is a little more recurring, who popped into a couple episodes here and there, maybe had a small arc. So I want you to use your artistic license here to give me your best guest star in the history of Friends, Winston Marshall. You're on the clock. Now, we've had a lot of really great superstars really come on this show. I mean, Danny DeVito was the crying stripper is amazing. <laughs> uh, ob obviously, obviously, uh, Reese Witherspoon and Christina Applegate as Rachel's sisters. Um, so many, so many great people, but by far the best guest star to grace friends has to be Brad Pitt. It's not even, it's not even close for a number of reasons. One, apparently all five of the friends in one form or another have some sort of weird crush on Brad Pitt as he shows up. Cause he, what, what can you say? He's hot. It is what it is. Right? Like Chandler at one point even stands up and looks at him and goes, I would come over and like hug you and say hi, but. I don't want to compare your body to mine. Like one of the funniest comments that anybody can resonate with if you met Brad Pitt. But the fact that this is a whole sequence where Brad Pitt hates 
Jennifer Aniston, and this is before the, the divorce, this is that they are very happily married at the time, that this is the, the wife he loves more than anything, and his character hates Rachel Green, is the funniest concept and the most meta thing that could have possibly happened on the show. Yeah, it's not art imitating life. It's sort of life being the funhouse mirror of what the art is and lampooning the real life. It's a great call, Roxy Stryer. How do you respond? Really good selection. I'm going to come for you in a minute. But before I do that, oh, wow. the it's a really good one, though. But the better choice is Bruce Willis. Now, let's talk about a man that at this point was already a mega star we've already done die hard we've already done pulp fiction we've done armageddon we've done the sixth sense we have made we've solidified our place in hollywood as an a-list celebrity major and then you come on this show and you say take me through the ringer you can make me into the biggest jerk and then also an absolute crying mess, whatever you want to do to me. He is in three episodes of the show. And every time we see him, we don't know what we're going to get from him. Uh, there is the possible top three best moment on the show with him. Uh, I'm just a love machine. <gasps> that is something that every time I watch it makes me hysterically laugh. We get to see him interact with Ross and be a complete jerk to him which is the best because kind of all of us want to be a jerk to ross at some point he's very annoying we don't discuss this enough but he's a very annoying character we get to see bruce willis and jennifer aniston totally make out thank you that gave me a lot to look at for a really long time i appreciate you guys for that and then we get to see this man completely melt down and start opening up the floodgates and start crying after sex and all of those things i mean he is the greatest person to be on this show and i wish that he was on honestly for an entire season because he deserved it all right so playing against type with both of your calls where we know that brad pitt at the time was happily with jennifer aniston going against that and then bruce willis being this macho tough guy that we knew from Die Hard and armageddon and then all of a sudden we see that he is a little softy inside after a while it's a, another good round we got going winston marshall back to you for your rebuttal why is your pick of brad pitt better than bruce willis as a guest star well i've already noticed that my friend roxy apparently is drifting off into space to call Bruce Willis, an A-list superstar, and not Brad Pitt. Well, we've already gotten seven. Fight Club, Snatch. Uh, he's he's uh, right in the same year Ocean's Eleven dropped. So he's already hit that. There's a reason people shrieked when he showed up on the screen, and it's not just his looks. But when you throw in the fact that some of the story, like you, any story where we get more backstory of the friends, and so we find out that Ross was also in the I Hate Rachel Green Club, the fact that Brad Pitt, whose body is a temple, is freaking out about complex carbohydrates. His two greatest enemies, Rachel Green and complex carbohydrates, is again, it is so meta that it is it is insane. It is it is otherworldly. And and I, I honestly, I, I can't think of anything as much as I love the huh! that is funnier than him slamming yams on his plate because he's losing his mind. All right, we're going full meta with a Brad Pitt. Roxy Stryer, your 30-second rebuttal. I'm not saying Brad Pitt wasn't an A-list celebrity, but the juxtaposition of diehard Bruce Willis and I can't stop crying after we've had sex, Bruce Willis. It's just night and day, the fact that he would let them do what they did to him on this show. And, okay, here's the problem with Brad Pitt. I'm going to go in. This isn't, this isn't necessarily his fault, but this is an episode that's called The One with the Rumor. And, oh, boy, does this episode not age as well as I think they were hoping for it. What the rumor is is that Jennifer Aniston is born with both uh, both sexual body parts, reproductive parts. They started a rumor about her that she had both a vagina and a penis. And everybody is standing there talking. That's the rumor that Brad Pitt started. And the rest of the friends are there in the 90s like, Ew, what are we talking about? This is 2021. When you rewatch that, it is like, Ugh. the other thing about Brad Pitt is that he comes back and the whole thing is now that he's hot because he lost weight just doesn't play as well in 2021. For the 90s, for the early 2000s, people might have been laughing about that. Now this episode, it's not even the best Thanksgiving episode. And the, yes, the Thanksgiving episodes are incredible, but this, while Brad Pitt embodies the character well and he looks great, 
the actual episode that he's in is kind of cringe at times comedy and don't i know it doesn't always age all that well so now we go back to final arguments winston what do you got i mean if we're gonna go out here and talk about cringe and you want to talk about weight loss does chandler not infinitely make fun of monica for being fat so if that's the case go ahead and take your point back from last round if that's the ammunition you want to use but if we're going to go here in all of that situation, one of the things that you have to remember is it's not just those cringe moments that make us go, oh, Lord, it's everything else surrounding it. Because if it was only cringe, this show wouldn't be what it is. Brad Pitt throughout the course of this episode, it steals the show. We don't even really pay attention to anybody other than Joey who's trying to finish a turkey by himself and puts on maternity pants. Otherwise, this is Brad Pitt's show and they're just all living in it. And that is the one difference with Bruce Willis. He's an add-on because his daughter's dating Ross. This is about Brad Pitt. That is not about Bruce, Bruce Willis. Those famous Thanksgiving episodes. All right, Rox, final statement. And then I got to make another tough call here. You're a neat guy. You are the man. You still got it. You're still sexy. You're just a love machine. You're just a love machine. Ha! <laughs> It's a pretty nice way to drop the mic I, on round number two <laughs> that even Winston's got to give it up for you. And I feel like this argument sort of morphed into a different topic where it's like what episode holds up better than the other one? If you're just talking about the best guest star, it almost feels like there was a fumble on the field and Winston just jumped on the ball first because Brad Pitt the fact that he was dating Jennifer Aniston at the time or they were married, whatever their relationship was, that it totally played against type. And that was must see TV. And I say that with a wink and a nod as NBC. NBC never had that slogan be more accurate than when Brad Pitt was guest starring on Friends. And so Bruce Willis knocked it out of the park. I love Bruce Willis in there. And for what it's worth, I love him and Matthew Perry in the whole nine yards together. But I got to give the point to Winston over Bruce Willis, Brad Pitt and those Sexy abs and that lack of complex carbohydrates gets the point <laughs> here. And I we got a mark, but also side ball game. <laughs> oh wow. Wait a minute. We didn't even we didn't even we didn't even finish yet. What do you get out of here? You know, I get <laughs> it, but monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting good, kids. It's now moving on to round number three. And that is gonna be incorporating humor into these sitcom friends. Funniest gag is your topic. Roxy, you took it on the last round. You get to rebound with your argument first. While a lot of people watch Friends like watching individual episodes, and they'll say, yeah, I've seen a few episodes. Really, Friends was for the diehard fans who for 10 years watched every single episode of this show. Which is why if you were watching for that entire time, there was something that stood out above all else. It's not only referenced in the finale, but all throughout the seasons. And that is uh, the alter ego of Regina Falange. Now, the Falange method is something that we get to see constantly come and save the day. Not only does she save Joey multiple times by uh, pretend when he was pretending he could speak French and she comes in as Regine Falange and she makes it so that he doesn't seem as absolutely asinine and stupid as he was coming across when he, you can't speak French, Joey, like, come on. And she comes in and she saves him. Uh, she also saves him when he's trying to be somebody's hands twin. And she comes in as Regina Falange to the poker table. She says, I'm a businesswoman. The, those hands, trust me, I'm Regina Falange. Those look exactly like this. She helps Chandler prep for his job interview because she is Regina Falange. Uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of the season, at the end of the series, we see her use the Regina Falange, which we have grown to love through 10 years to stop the plane so that Rachel can get off the plane because there is something wrong with the left Falange. So not only did this gag make us laugh several times, not only does Regina Falange, somebody that we're like, wow, we fully believe that Phoebe could do that because she is just out of this world bonkers sometimes, but then it is the thing that causes our favorite moment in the entire series, which is that Rachel gets off of the plane. So it is the saving grace of this show, and it is the funniest gag. That was a great answer. I was expecting like Ross's leather pants or his teeth whitener, but this is really getting deep into the show and into the mythology of Friends. Winston Marshall, you got a tough competition here. Not really. This is actually very easy. <laughs> you like, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Now, 
when you think about friends, you think about, again, what binds them all together? How well do they know each other? How much can they get underneath each other's skin? And I'm going to say right now, uh, you know, season four, as we mentioned, is right there, the kind of the meat of the sandwich here. Phoebe's having her brother's brother's baby. You know what I'm saying? Like all of these amazing things, all of it comes down to the trivia game. It is so poignant, in fact, that the reunion actually structured most of the show around them replaying the trivia game. It's been widely known that it's both Courtney Cox's and Matt LeBlanc's favorite episode that they ever shot, and it has everything you would potentially want out of it. You get a little bit of a teaser in Act 1 when they're playing with the grocery bag. Ross and his nerdy self decides, I'll write the whole game. I don't even want to do the thing, but I'll write the questions. I'm here for it. And when he, when they were like, well, we'll get someone else, he goes, no, 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 I'll play, I'll play. Like, And then the competition. We find out about Maurice the Space Cowboy, uh, Miss <laughs> Chenandler Bong. Like, I could go on forever, and I will in my follow-up argument, but this is a solid moment that if you want to show someone what is friends, you show them this episode, and you're like, I am hooked. Okay, I want to stay with Winston for his follow-up argument because my follow-up question is the way that Roxy sort of let us know that the Regina Falange gag was recurring throughout it. Tell us more about how the trivia game was able to incorporate so much of Friends lore within it. Well, for example, the very the very last question that cost the girls the game is what is Chandler Bing's job? And they're just uh, <laughs> oh, uh, something with numbers. Uh, he's a trans. Uh, he does something with trans. That's right. He's a trans. He's a trans monster. That's not even a word. Like that whole moment, the fact that the apartment is riding on it, and for then half the season, the boys get to live in the night's apartment, and Rachel is freaking out from everything to the the singing guy across the hall, the across the window. The morning's here. We don't get any of that. We get zero of that if the girls don't lose the game. So by putting this game with such high stakes. And to see how it flips and then even how the girls get their apartment back, you can't beat it. You absolutely cannot beat it. We got a lot of high stakes with that trivia game because the apartments were on the line there, Roxy. So how do you counter that with your recurring Regina Falange? I like a feel-good gag. I like something that makes me laugh. I like something that gets us that W, that victory. I'm always rooting for the underdog. Uh, and Regina Falange is that. What I don't like is feeling devastated for some of these characters. This was a really upsetting episode. The trivia game was crushing because you're no longer rooting for the underdogs. In what world is it acceptable that these men, when the women are so crushed, actually go through and take their apartment? It, it <laughs> is When you're watching it, you're, you feel pain in your chest. Like, I cannot believe that this is happening. So while it is a good episode, it actually led to the girls losing their apartment, which was really hard to watch. Even though all the, the Rachel not feeling okay with the dropping of the food and the, the uh, everything that's taking place, you feel bad for them and you're just hoping they get their apartment back, which you know is going to happen because it's a sitcom. So the stakes are low, but your feelings are real and it's, it sucks and it hurts. Well, let's be honest. If you get either one of those apartments in New York at a decent price, you're feeling pretty good about you're life. Pretty so, good about yourself. Winston, going back to you, final yeah. argument to stand the trivia game. The early part of this is, is very simple. Roxy didn't talk up about how Regina Falange was better. She tried to downplay the trivia game. So in the sense that she didn't go, well, these are other reasons why Regina Falange is better. She was like, the, the trivia game is, oh, no, and all that kind of, but that's the thing, though. We don't feel that bad in the sense that, like, yeah, you're like, oh, dang, poor girls, but, like, the guys are so elated. There is an argument that is then cut with the tension of Phoebe being pregnant, and, of course, within what, 10 episodes, the girls get it back in an even funnier moment where they try to bet it and they do it with some Knicks tickets, but it ultimately just takes just the, the, the girls making out for five seconds. The guys be like, totally worth it. And then be like, guys are so dumb. Like it was so perfect the way from start to finish during that episode and after how it just brought everything together in season four. All right, Rox, closing argument. Thank you for the tee up, Winston. Regina Flange is better because this show had the wherewithal to plant 
about 10 different Regina Falange scenarios, the one with Ken Adams, uh, the one with Chandler, every single time they did it, it was a tee up to the final episode, thought of as one of the best finales in any show ever, in my opinion, the absolute best finale of any show. And that is the crux of the episode that makes it all worthwhile with a 10 year will they won't they relationship. It's all because of Regina Falange. So not only is it the funniest gag, but then the payoff is bigger than any other gag on the show. Okay, quick follow up question for Roxy. Uh, Have you ever used the name Regina Falange to get into something has anybody ever asked you what's your name and you didn't feel like giving it your them your real name have you ever dropped the regina for for certain i've said the left phalange is broken when i don't know what's going on how do i fix the internet the left phalange is broken there's nothing we can do well the phalange on this show working just fine thanks to our lovely engineer christian <laughs> rubokaba and i had this as going to Winston in the trivia game until that final argument swayed me where so much of this entire show was based on calling back this one name that never felt like it was forced or never felt like it was tired. And it was such an impactful part of the last episode. And Roxy did, I think, correctly say that it's one of the better series finales that you could ever get because there's so much pressure whether it's it's Seinfeld or whether it's Cheers whatever it is I think Friends hit it pretty far out of the park and the left phalange is a reason why and so while I love the concept of a trivia game determining apartments amongst friends and I would love to actually participate in that someday and I think everybody here can know how seriously we take trivia sometimes I was but gonna say, I'm going to need to retire. <laughs> I'm going to give the win here by the skin of her phalange to mm-hmm. Roxy Stryer. So Roxy, congratulations. You're up two to one now, but we this still one's have for you, Regina. at least one more round to go because it's time for round four. And that is the question that we all ask ourselves before we go to bed. And when we wake up in the morning, who's the best friend, Winston Marshall, Who's your best friend? Okay, so you got six phenomenal characters by far, but there is definitely a a tier uh, of these characters by like, and I would have to say the only S tier character that we have out of the six has to be Chandler for a number of reasons. I think other than the fact that whenever we needed some sort of joke to cut the tension, he was always there with it. He was always ready with a quick remark, always there with some smart athlete thing. There is not a single character uh, that has grown more than Chandler. You can maybe make the argument for Rachel just because of where she comes in, but then she ultimate, but like at around when she kind of ends up getting pregnant with Ross's baby, she's kind of hit her peak, but Chandler learned as Roxy so eloquently put before learns how to commit he realizes he's in a dead end job that he hates. So he puts everything on the line in order to go and get a job that works for him. He f- struggles with smoking a lot, but we all have our struggles and he deals with that. And then every time a serious moment happened, it was Chandler that gave those last words that made us go, dang, homie, thank thank you for that. So by far and away, Chandler has run away with being the best of all the friends. Chanandler Bong is on the board. Roxy Stryer, how do you counter with your best friend? There was a time about seven years ago where I was asked this question and Chandler was also my answer. But as I've grown, I've realized that Chandler is a very good friend. He is, in fact, the second best friend, but he is not the first best friend. And growing up means knowing that you were previously wrong and you can now admit that Phoebe is absolutely, without a doubt, the best friend. You talk about growth, Winston. Phoebe is somebody who we find out her life story. We don't know as much backstory on any other character as we do Phoebe. Phoebe was homeless. And this is a, I want to remind everybody, this is a sitcom. And Phoebe is the funniest person on the sitcom. And this is her story. She is homeless. She is abandoned. Her mother commits suicide and she carries her brother's child. That is who we are talking about as the funniest character. How an actress somehow managed to make all of that comedy, 
I have no idea. Not only is this is she the best friend on this show, but Phoebe Buffay and Lisa Kudrow's performance as Phoebe Buffay is one of the best characters we've ever seen on any platform ever. The way that she makes us laugh, no matter what she's talking about, no matter what she's been through, the way that she doesn't judge anybody else, the way that this is a show in the 90s and we had a character that was quirky, that was alone for a really long time, that went on plenty of dates, but also hated things like Pottery Barn. Like we, this was somebody we had never seen before. So talk about growth. This girl went from being homeless on the streets at 14, learning French in a behind a dumpster to being with Mike. What? What is that transit? It's unbelievable the amount of growth and she's the best friend. All right. This is going to be a great debate here because you picked my two favorite friends of all time and I vastly between who I love more daily. So Winston, back to you for a 30 second rebuttal. Why is Chandler a better friend than Phoebe? I once again go back to his growth. I once again first point to the fact that Roxy clearly doesn't think Phoebe's that great of a friend. If you didn't think her relationship was good enough to include in that argument early up top and you went with Chandler, you talked about how Chandler really grew into the man that we saw by the end of the show that was so phenomenal. But let's talk about some of the other really problematic things going on in Chandler's life that he actually stops doing and becomes a better person. There's a girl he dated at summer camp that he broke up with because she was too fat and makes those jokes about Monica all the time. And he has learned the air of his ways and doesn't do that anymore. He is a much better person for doing that. You have a man that watching his parents' horrible divorce and finding out that his father is gay ends up saying some really awful, terrible things, but at the end of it realizes not only that that's his father and loves his father unconditionally, but starts to accept and not be such a closed-minded, essentially bigot, if we're being honest. But you know what I'm saying? So when you actually look at the idea of how society has evolved, how we don't fat shame anymore, or we try not to, we try not to be homophobic. Chandler is all of us making that giant step from being in those dark ages to being really a more well put together, well-rounded person that's accepting of everybody. I've seen a lot of personal growth and character growth in this round. Roxy, I'll ask you the inverse. Why is Phoebe a better friend than Chandler? When it comes to Chandler, the, one of the problems that you find upon rewatch after rewatch, which is why he dropped the slot in my book. Now, we never knew what Matthew Perry we were going to get because he sometimes was showing up and everything was landing. And sometimes when you're rewatching, you're like, hello, are you here today, Matthew Perry? Because it doesn't feel like you are. There was never a single scene that Lisa Kudrow didn't show up for. And I know that I'm arguing for Phoebe right now, but not only is she playing Phoebe, but she's also playing Ursula. And the, and the fact that she put so much effort into Phoebe in so many small, minute details that the second Ursula walks in a room, even though it's Lisa Kudrow, we know it's Ursula because the, her her aura is different than the character that she created for Phoebe. It just shows how uh, layered Phoebe is. Also, when we're talking about the best friend, Phoebe is better at being a friend to the other friends. Phoebe is the one who tries to keep the marriages together. And when somebody's flying off to London, tries to prevent them from doing it. She's the one who tells all the other friends the things that they don't necessarily want to hear, but they need to, as opposed to Chandler, who is always messing with Joey uh, and just keeps give, writing him checks, but doesn't actually support him in the way that he believes in him. He doesn't think he's that good. And it comes out in these friendship bracelets. Uh, I think that Phoebe is the better friend and better at being a friend. I did send Winston a friendship bracelet and he is yet to wear it. Uh, Winston, your final argument. Hey, you got it. There we go. Um, the woman repeller. You <laughs> have your final <laughs> argument. It is upon us. You got to stump one more time for your boy Chandler. To say that Chandler is not a supportive friend is absolutely chaotic and crazy. Monica is chaotic and crazy with her over-organization, and he supports and loves that woman. Too. He might put a couple jokes at it, but I don't know many friends that I'm not poking fun at them, but really supporting them. The same with Joey. Joey's acting career would have been over if Chandler wasn't paying for headshots and rent and everything that he did till Joey made it to where he needed to go. If you want to talk about just pure unadulterated support, there's that. But let alone the fact that he has been in Ross's life, and Ross is a lot. 
this entire time and still considers himself so close, let alone the fact that when he had to give up for his New Year's resolution not to make fun of people and he held that all in and let it let it back out, once again, he is that real type of friend that a thousand percent will be there for you, hug you, love you, let you know everything's going to be okay. But he's also going to make sure that you stay a little wise because the world is rough out there and Chandler makes sure that you're ready for it. All right, Roxy, one more time. Walk us down Phoebe memory lane. No matter what Phoebe has gone through, she shows all of us that it's okay to find love and laughter and humor and everything. And I don't think any of us know people who have had a uh, as challenging or more challenging of a life than Phoebe. The way that she's presented to us is like, this is a girl who comes from severe trauma but every single day she plays her guitar she sings her song she doesn't care what the world thinks she's fighting for happiness and she also practices forgiveness with everybody she gets screwed by every single friend at some point between burning down her apartment or trying to set her up with a stranger because they're not paying attention she's always giving more than she gets and she still loves just the same she is the greatest just the greatest you know i i don't know if this is a hot take or not but i think I'm going to safely say that you could have Ross and Joey, Chandler, excuse me, not Chandler and not Phoebe, but you can have Ross and Joey and you can have Monica and Rachel and the casting department knocked the show out of the park with all six friends. If we got someone else playing those four roles, I still think the show survives and has a great run if you get Matthew Perry's Chandler and you get Lisa Kudrow as Phoebe. I think those are the two best castings in the history of the show for this reason, that they both played their jobs so well, with Chandler being the funny, witty one and Phoebe being the in their own universe. So if you need a funny person on a sitcom, but you also need somebody who's going to be that Kramer who comes in and out at their own whim and just gets big laughs every time. The difference here is that I feel like with Phoebe, there's a reason why Phoebe and Mike is that relationship that is third behind Ross and Rachel and Chandler and Monica is that it doesn't seem like the show ever thought she was as essential as some of those other friends. And so while I go back and forth between whether Phoebe or Chandler is my personal favorite friend, it's inarguable that Chandler shaped the sense of humor of an entire generation, I think a lot more than he gets credit for because I see it in comedy clubs every night. I see a lot of Phoebe in a lot of comedy sense friends, and I see a lot of people basing their lives around Phoebe mantras. But as far as being a character in a sitcom where the goal is to get as many laughs as you can in 22 minutes, I think I'm giving the edge here to Chandler. So that also is convenient for me because it just gets us a two to two tie. <laughs> now we get to go to our tiebreaker round. I made all my picks, honestly, but now we get to a tiebreaker round. So this there is how the go. tiebreaker round works. It's a little bit different. It's not quite a speed round, but you each have one minute to give your arguments and then I have to render a verdict. So I'm kind of putting myself in jail by doing that. But I think we got a pretty good sudden death topic for us here today. So round five okay. is going to be about What's the best quote in the history of friends? This can be some long soliloquy. I don't think I'm going to get that with either one of y'all today. I think you're looking for comedy gold. The best quote in friends history. Roxy Stryer, you get to go first. It's not always that the most memorable is the best. But in this case, it is. If you ask anybody what is what they think of friends if they've never seen an episode they know about ross and rachel and they know that ross and rachel were on a break we were on a break this is the debate that people use for other shows people take other shows and they say are they the ross and rachel will they won't they were they on a break we were on a break is not only something that is used throughout the entire show from the second that they were on a break, and by the way, we could get into this debate all day at a bar, wherever we are, were they or won't they? I have thoughts on both sides of that. It is a, a huge argument, a huge conversation starter for friends, fans alike around the world. But not only is it that, but it also provides so much comedy on the show that in the finale episode, as they're getting back together and they're saying, we're going to do this for real forever, Ross turns to Rachel and says, unless we're on a break 
and every Friends fan anywhere you were lost it because you have feelings on this. You have an opinion. Were they on a break? Were they not on a break? Does it matter? 13 pages front and back. It, this is something that we all feel in our blood because you it's a, a relationship show about this center relationship and whether you believe them to be toxic or not. If you're a Friends fan, you were probably rooting for them. And so this matters to you. It's the best quote. It's the most memorable quote. It's a, a quote that people who've never even seen the show know. And wizard behind the curtain here, Roxy intimated having a bar conversation about this. Like, we're not going to be arguing about this at a bar in a mere matter of hours, probably. Straight up. Straight up. Winston Marshall, it's, I mean, she picked arguably the most memorable quote. So you got a mountain to climb here. What is the best quote? in friends series history so that that is definitely one to go up against for sure but there's two things that i think we want to take away from friends at the end of the day the first that we get just from life in general is that sex sells correct that's the, the one thing that you hear all the time but secondly and more important this show was always about teaching us how to grow up how to adult and I think one of the things that a lot of men did not do well, but especially in the 90s, early 2000s, is to take into consideration your sexual partners. You, you were just worried about getting your own thing off. So by far, the best quote from Friends was, and the reason why is not only do you get so many little nuggets, you talked about laughs per minute, so many laughs from like, that's one that's a pretty important one. Oh, i'm looking at it upside down sometimes that's pretty good the number of laughs just from that moment let alone with monica be like a one two a one two three a three four a three five a two four six two four seven five seven six seven 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 and rachel's over here like oh jesus that moment made every dude go, oh, snap. First of all, what are the seven? I, like, cause, cause, cause Chandler, he's like, one, two, three, he goes, cool. Set, what, wait, there are seven? And like, you know what I'm saying? The, the simple fact that that blew so many men's lives and I guarantee made so many women's lives better now. Cause now men were like, have I really been screwing this up so bad? It changed, and you want to talk about changing a generation that changed a generation. Uh, hopefully for the better in a lot of cases. And uh, I mean, I'm always considerate in the bedroom just because, <laughs> hey, I'm happy to be there, okay? I'm just happy I got the invite. So <laughs> Friends has shaped us in multiple ways, and we've learned that once again here today on this episode of Binge Battle to render a verdict if it does apply to you in a couplehood if you're trying to work on your relationship with your partner i'm definitely going the way of winston here which is know the numbers and know how they correlate to your respective partner but in the context of friends there was one quote and it wasn't pivot by ross which actually is one of my personal favorites oh, it gosh. was pivot. we were on a break it's just that exasperation it's that miscommunication that is the crux of so many sitcoms where i thought you were here but you were here then wait then who's over there it's always that oh i didn't the ship's passing in the night we're not on the same page you need conflict in relationships it happens and in sitcoms we need it to happen and it was never better than the we were on a break. And what is the actual definition of a break? So whereas Winston's quote probably helped a lot of folks in the bedroom, the we were <laughs> on a break conversation probably got a lot of couples together, but it also broke up couples who were not supposed to be together. So wow. we were on a break <laughs> is going to be the tiebreaker point. Roxy Stryer gets the win and she is your binge battle friends champion. But what a sterling performance by both Roxy and Winston yeah! Marshall here oh! today. I know it's heartbreaking to lose because you both have clearly based your lives around friends. I think the only way to do this better next time would be to have you all back and we actually do trivia and whoever wins gets their pick of that person's apartment. You all in? Definitely. Um, I would like to thank my family for putting a eight inch screen uh, TV in the kitchen for me to watch VHSs of friends before school every day. Thank you so much for supporting me and my dreams. Appreciate you. It's just one of the Winston, you, you took an L here today, but who do you want to thank for bringing friends into your life? 
Uh, I got to think my home. I don't know if you'll ever see this, but my homie Stephen Chow. I mean, again, I, this the show genuinely wasn't on my radar when it first dropped. But once I was, uh, once it was made apparent to me, I never let it go from that point forward. So shout out to Stephen Chow for, you know, being like, bro, you got to see this. It's an all-time great show, and I'm glad that people are are still new generations are uncovering how much fun Friends can be because at the time, growing up with it around every Thursday, it was everywhere. It was like that 1989 summer when you saw Batman everywhere, except you just kept getting Friends season after season after season, and we never really got sick of it. So that is going to be the result of today's binge battle with Roxy Stryer as your winner. So she gets to give us her streaming recommendations first. You can find her at Roxy Stryer. Roxy, what are your streaming recommendations? And I'm looking at some of your contenders. It seems like you had a lot to tell us. Yeah. Have I mentioned that I'm alone, Mark? Uh, I, I watch a lot of television, just like so much TV. Uh, on on Winston's point about people needing to learn about uh, sex and seven, sex education to me is just the one of the greatest shows that's ever been put out. Its third season was just dropped. And the fact that People still are finding this show, uh, and and it was just picked up for a fourth season too. I cannot I cannot recommend the show enough. Do yourself a favor. But that's a show that you might have heard of. Some shows that I just kind of stumbled upon that I didn't hear many people talking about. You guys know about Schmigadoon? You know about Schmigadoon? Yeah, I'm gonna say no. This is a, a Cecily Strong, Keegan Michael Key six episode show that is so funny. It's like a, a musical but a comedy about relationships and, and it, yes. it, Oh, I, I cry laughing. It's so funny. Oh my God. This is so good. Martin short is in it. Kristen Chenoweth is in it. This cast is an all-star cast and it's only six episodes. Like you'll binge it so fast. It's perfect. I, I remember seeing an ad for that and I was like, I love everybody in this. And so I might have to give this one a shot. So those are two pretty good recommendations. Winston is not a competition anymore. So you can oh. just feel free to give your recommendation and we're going to love it regardless. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, you know, if that's the case, I was, I was ready. Um, I, I think the, 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 the two main things that I've been watching, I've been flipping back and forth right now. Um, a lot of, you know, the show originally was on Fox, got picked up by a streaming service. I'm talking about Lucifer, the series finale, the final season is popping off right now. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, you have to check it out. Um, it, it is the perfect send off for all the people that went out and campaigned to keep the show on air so they could get the end of the stories. This is an incredible end to the series and i absolutely love it um and then the other thing i'm watching right now is squid game um if you like if you like hunger games if you like battle royale if you like uh you know parasite uh this is a korean thriller that takes all of that and crams it into one and you're just sitting there with your jaw on the floor so you absolutely don't want to miss either of those cannot recommend them enough at all so check them out Two good recommendations, four good recommendations from our guests here. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it for them. They're also big fans of following their respective football teams currently. Winston, the Cowboys, Roxy, the Patriots. And so <laughs> I can't say best of luck to both of you in your seasons, given my Washington football team fandom. But it's just another thing for all of us friends to debate about once we get to said bar. That's going to do it here for Binge Battle. Make sure you're following us at Rotten Tomatoes for all the latest updates going on in the world of everything from movies being released to streaming shows to fun stuff like this where we revisit some of our favorite entertainment options of all time. I'm your host, Mark Ellis. That is Roxy Stryer. You can find her at Roxy Stryer. That is Winston Marshall. You can find him at The Swaggy Blurred. For everybody here behind the scenes, our incredible engineer, Christian Rubalcaba, our great producer, Eileen, I... And once again, Mark, and I have to go feed my little Marcel the monkey, Molly the Wonder Dog. So until next time, thanks for watching this reboot of Binge Battle.